那那个今天我们特别呃欢迎到去年也有来的的教学龙，那呃教学龙是呃是呃 Spring 呃 Spring 的的 OK， 那他们现在好像是在 Under 呃 VMware 底下，那基本上来讲，他今天要介绍是 Asaki。阿萨克的游戏，那阿萨克是一个呃，最近好像才刚到 1.0 吧，算是一个蛮火红的专案。对，我记得好像还有 Netflix 也在里面。那现在重点就是嘉许会带着我们，哦，然后最后最后帮嘉许打一下广告。嘉许有一本新书《Re r e a t Spring》，来，那好像评价还蛮好的，所以有兴趣可以再看看。那我也不要浪费大家的时间。那我们接下来就是呃，嘉许可以 start your session. Thanks. Hello, everybody. 那个 what time is it? Let's see. It's uh six, seven o'clock. So ten o'clock in the morning over there, I think, roughly somewhere in there, very close to. I am so happy to see you. Good morning to all of you.、Uh, I wish I could be there.、Uh, I have heard about your country's amazing, amazing、uh, response to the、uh, to the, the the coronavirus. You know, and I'm 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 I wish. Uh, that I could be there. I wish that I could leave、uh, safely, you know, this country. But、uh, I really miss you. I miss the、uh, I miss the opportunity. I, I think about my time there last year, and I think about delicious stinky tofu, and oh, I just miss it. So I'm very happy to see you all, even if only virtually.、Uh, my name is Josh Long. I work on the Spring team. I'm a Kotlin Google developer expert, a Spring developer advocate, and a Java champion. And of course, I'm at your service. So if you have questions. Or comments or whatever, please find me online. I'm <clears throat> at Starbucks Man on Twitter, and my email is Josh at JoshLong dot com.、Uh, I'm happy to to connect. Right. Also,、uh, if you want to follow the code, it's there at GitHub dot com. Josh Long R Socket Revolution. So it's there for you to see. <clears throat> now, a little bit about me. I work on the Spring team. I used to travel when it was safe, but now, of course, it's dangerous.、Uh, I have training videos online. Uh, you can find them in Safari. I have an old book I did called Cloud Native Java. I have a new podcast called A Beautiful Podcast, which is now two years old. I have a blog I do every Tuesday. That's、uh, yesterday or two days ago for you,、uh, where I reprint all the news that's interesting in the Spring ecosystem.、Uh, and then, of course, a, v,、uh, a video series、uh, on YouTube called、uh, Spring Tips. And of course, my new book, Reactive Spring. And this book. Is now available for purchase. I just published it a couple of months ago,、uh, and it's available online in PDF and EPUB and Mobi, or at, in a printed edition. And this book is all about how to build reactive applications. I love reactive applications, and I think about them a lot of the time. The only problem is that、uh, when we talk about reactive applications, we talk about the basic protocol, the basic API that reactive programming enables. Right? If you use reactive programming. Then you have to change the way that you write your code, and the reason that you change the way that you write your code is because you need to take advantage of three benefits of reactive programming. One, it's more resource efficient, so it takes up less、uh, thread in your application, and it also embraces asynchronous I/O. You see, even if threads were very cheap and you could create as many as you wanted, you would still have the problem where each input stream and output stream. Takes several kilobytes of space of RAM, so you cannot have an infinite number of、uh, threads if you have limited、uh, I/O input and output. And of course, threads are not free either; they're not cheap today. In a year, they might be cheap, but then input stream and output streams will be inefficient. So, we want to take advantage of the more resource efficient alternative, something like reactive programming. That's the first thing. The second thing that we care about is reactive programming gives me a consistent API. It gives me a simple way to talk about and work with other sources of data, and this this data might be asynchronous, it might be、uh, slow, it might take a long time. But reactive programming gives me one interface, one mechanism to this this kind of data. And the third thing that we care about when we talk about reactive programming is the、uh, ability to create、uh, to handle rather to handle volatile or、uh, 
rough experiences, you know, difficult experiences in a production system, right? So when a service fails, I want to have an API that allows me to retry the request, to do timeouts, to gracefully degrade if there are errors, etc. So reactive APIs gives me resource efficiency, a consistent API, and the ability to write more secure, more robust code. These things make reactive programming very powerful. And one of the things that I love about reactive programming is this concept of back pressure. This idea of back pressure is something that we can use to make sure that we are not overwhelmed. The problem is that back pressure is a Java API concept that is inspired by concepts at the lower levels, things like TCP and UDP, and at the systems level, things like a message broker. But back pressure uh, isn't, every, isn't available everywhere. Not every protocol understands back pressure. One of those protocols is HTTP. It doesn't understand back pressure. Uh, and this makes it a, a little problematic if you want to have true, uh, if you want to truly get the benefits of uh, of a protocol, right? So I want support for something like back pressure. I also want in my protocol, I want support for doing uh, other kinds of message exchanges besides fire, uh, besides request and response, right? So with HTTP and HTTP two, I can do request response, and that's basically it. The problem here is that there are a limited number of message exchange patterns. I want something that supports fire and forget. I want something that supports bi-directional communication. I want something that supports long loaded connections. I want something that supports uh, multiplex communication. So I want more flexibility in the protocol that I use for communication, right? And HTTP fails me there. The other thing that I want is something that's, uh, that as a protocol allows me to build services where I do not care about the payload. So it's very common for people to use something like gRPC. gRPC uh, requires you to use Google protocol buffs and it requires code generation. This is not the best arrangement for uh, you know for building services at scale, right? Because it means that you are forcing people to draw, do everything in a certain way. So this is problematic. Uh, and what I want is something that gives me the ability to use whatever payload I want to support bi-directional communication with all sorts of different kinds of interactions. And I want something uh, that uh, is fast and it supports back pressure on the wire. This is where OnSocket comes in. OnSocket is a brand new protocol. It's not brand new, it's, a, it's several years old. But it's a new protocol that was developed by engineers at uh, Netflix who went to Facebook. And these engineers are trying to build a better service for a better protocol for services, high speed services. And so today, my friends, we're going to see all of that in action. We're going to see what it looks like to build an all socket based service and system uh, together. And we're going to do that by going to my second favorite place on the internet. Obviously, my first favorite place on the internet is production. I love production. You should love production. You should go as early and often as possible. Bring the kids, bring the family. The weather's amazing. It's a happy place on earth. is better than Disneyland. But if you have not been to production, then you can begin your journey here at start. That spring that I So what we're going to do is we're going to build an application called Service, and we're going to use uh, the latest and greatest version of Java, Java 2.4, uh, and Java 2.4, by the way, uh, a Spring Boot 2.4 rather, uh, has some really nice features that make it uh, a perfect choice in a cloud environment. It makes it a perfect choice in a uh, Kubernetes environment in particular. Right. So I really like uh, Spring Boot 2.4. One of the things that it has uh, is it has um, features that allow it to mount uh, config maps as a directory for configuration in Kubernetes. It has features to support building native images with Graal VM. Uh, it has features that allow it to do graceful shutdown when your pod in a Kubernetes cluster is killed. It has a, a, you know, you can tell your application to stop accepting incoming requests. All of these features make this a very, very interesting release indeed. And I encourage you to check it out. But we're going to just take a look at some of the features inside of our socket. So we're going to build a new service here called Service. We're going to use our socket. We're going to use the Spring Security to support. Uh, we're going to use, um, what else do we need to use? I don't know if we need much else. We need Lumbach, right? A Lumbach is a nice way to build our application there. Uh, and I think, my friends, that will do it, right? We could talk to a SQL database or something like that. But for our purposes, there's really no need. So we'll just use our socket and Spring Security and Lumbach. Uh, I've just made a serious mistake. You see, friends, I've accepted the default versions, and this is another mistake that you should not make. I, I forgot 
to visit this arrangement of options here. We have three options in front of us, friends. Java's 15, 11, and 8. Java 15 is the current supported version of Java. Java 11 is the current long-term supported version of Java. Java 8 is a non-choice. It's a choice that you could make, but that you should not make ever. It's a terrible version of Java. It's the old, no longer supported, past its prime version of Java. Do the right thing. Use Java 11 or 15. They are the current supported versions of Java. They're technically superior in every way. They're faster, they have more features, more syntax, more security, more robust, more performant. They're just better in every way. They're also morally the right version of Java. Have you ever seen the sad look of despair in your children's eyes when they learn that you're using Java 8 in production? I don't think you're going to like that, friends. I don't think you're going to like that sad, sad face. Don't do it. Use Java 15 if you can do it, OK? So we're going to go ahead and use Java 15. We're going to hit generate. And that will give me a service here. OK, UAOF service.zip. This is going to open it up in my IDE. OK, so here we go. larger, huh? I don't know if I... How about that? Okay. We'll try that. Hopefully you can still see that. Good. I hope. Is that going to work? Okay. Well, anyway. So for now, we're going to build a new application. And consider... Uh, let's take a brief moment and talk about some of the uses of reactive programming before we go too far into the discussion of R socket, okay? So reactive programming uh, is a very simple idea. We're trying to write code where we give the runtime, the scheduler, uh, a, a any time it can. Uh, what is this thing here? What is that URL there, friend? Oh, okay. Um, so okay, um, we want to give our runtime. Uh, a sense of when we're doing something where it's asynchronous, where we can stop uh, monitoring the result, where we can wait asynchronously for the result. And so we can use the reactive streams types. The reactive streams types are a set of interfaces that allow us to describe asynchronous eventual streams of data. The idea is you have a publisher. The publisher publishes data to a subscriber. The subscriber, when it first subscribes, it is given a subscription. When there are new records, the onNext method is called. When there are errors, the onError method is called. And finally, when you're done processing the data, the onComplete method is called. So this publisher publishes a little more. Really? I uh, Sure, let me try. It's already at 20. Let's try 24. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So we have a publisher that publishes data asynchronously to a subscriber. The subscriber, when it first subscribes, it is given a subscription. This subscription is what the subscriber uses to ask for more data. I can say, I request, let's say, ten records or a hundred records. It doesn't matter. And if it does not want to process any more data, it can call cancel. This subscription is how the subscriber avoids do, doing too much work. It's avoiding uh, the situation where it cannot scale if it ne needs to. So subscribe. This, the subscription is very important. It allows the subscriber to push back on the uh, producer. This is called flow control or back pressure. And it's very important that you understand this concept because it helps us to build more reliable systems. If I am a consumer and I cannot be overwhelmed or denial of service, and I have the ability to stay alive and handle more requests for a longer time, right? This is very important. So publisher, subscriber, and then there's a fourth type called processor, okay? Processor. Uh, and these, these reactive streams types, it's just a bridge. It's a source and a sink. 
And they're very useful, but they're very foundational, very basic. And so there are two specialized types that come from Project Reactor. Reactor is part of, it's, a, it's an open source library that we built on the Spring team. Uh, and Reactor gives us two specialized types. One is called a Flux, and a Flux is a publisher. It's a publisher, but there's also Mono. So a Mono is also a publisher. You see that? It's a, it's a publisher. Both are publishers, but a Mono only has at most one value. A Flux has multiple values, okay? So 0, 1, 2, 5, a million, a trillion, etc. So these are the reactive types, and they make our lives easier. So what I want to do now is to create a reactive stream. And I'm going to do that by creating a greeting service, just a, a service that produces data, okay? It's just going to produce some sample data. Greeting response, greet. Greeting request, request, okay? So I'm just creating a simple endpoint here. It's a service. And the service is just going to be a regular spring bean that requires a, uh, a payload type, so class, and a response value type. Okay. Good. There's my payload, and there's my types. And all I want to do is return a stream of results. So whenever somebody asks me to send a greeting with a name, I'll send them back a, re a response, or I'll send them back many responses with a message. Okay, so add all arms and so on and so on. Okay, there's my basic annotations. So what I want to do is I want to use that to create my getters and my setters. And here I'm going to create a reactive stream. Okay, a stream where I generate the results like so. New reading response or you can do me how there you go, right? So request uh, get name instant dot now. Okay. There we go. So there's my reactive stream, but this is a lot of, this will produce an infinite stream of records. And so what I want to do is I want to make this, this stream go even, uh, go a little bit slower. And so I will use delayed elements. I'm going to slow it down by one second. Now this is an a, a asynchronous stream of data. I want to provide the stream to the world. So I'm going to use an R socket controller to do that. I'll say at controller class uh, R socket readings. Controller, okay. Private final meeting service, and we're going to create a simple endpoint here at message mapping called greetings, and the stream will just return all the greetings responses, you know, given a greetings request. Okay, so greetings request, greetings request, and at required args constructor. And we say return this dot greeting service dot greet request. Okay, very simple, very trivial example. So I want to expose this R socket endpoint to the world, and you can see how easy it is to do that. I'm using the Spring annotations that you probably already know at controller, uh, at message mapping, etc. These are all these have been here for many, many, many years, uh, and we are using them for R socket as well. Uh, and that's because we have built a component model on top of the low level Java client for R socket. Remember, our socket is a binary protocol. There are clients from many different languages. The Java client is built using Reactor. So all I need to do in Spring is to give it a port. Okay, eight 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 eight. Right. Good luck. Right. So I will start this run, and then that will be available. Let me turn off the heater in my room here. Oops. Security. All right, so uh, what happened here? We have an issue where, oh, I forgot to comment out these other dependencies. Okay. Okay, there's our service. Now we can talk to this R socket endpoint pretty easily just by using RSC. So RSC, TCP, localhost 8888. The route is called greetings, and uh, the type of interaction uh, is called a stream. So there are four interactions, right? One is where you send one value in and you get one value out. So request response. 
The other kind of interaction is stream, where you send one value in and you get multiple values out. Okay, so that's called stream. That's what we're doing here. The other uh, interaction is channel, where you send multiple values in and you get multiple values out. And the other interaction after that is fire and forget. You send one value and you get no response. This is very convenient, by the way, because there are lots of use cases where you don't care about the acknowledgement. Is it? Okay, hold on. Can you see my screen now? What about now? Still small or no? Even more, okay. Okay. Is that okay? Hi. Okay, good. Okay, so now I can't see. Let's see. Um, so now I have this uh, endpoint, and I want to connect to it from the command line, right? So I'm using the RC, the RSC command line utility. It's a free open source piece of software that uh, we on the Spring team, uh, one of our one of our uh, amazing engineers, Toshiaki Maki, he, um, he developed this, right? So this endpoint, whoops, uh, you have to send some data in. So you can say, name, JCC conf, and there we go, right? There's my, my uh, unlimited stream of results, okay? Now, of course, I don't want this to be unlimited. I want this to be limited. I want to only have a little bit of data. So I'll only take, let's say, 100 records, right? Or whatever, 10 records. My rewritten uh, service. Now, consider what I've done. I have a service that's going to produce a new value every second for the next however long it takes. Um, and that's OK, because in between each message, it will free up the thread. The thread is being used by the runtime to handle other requests. So we don't waste our thread in this scenario. Okay. So now we've looked at how to use the RSC client. Let's now look at how to build a, uh, a client, uh, uh, an actual Java client. And before we look at the dedicated uh, RSocket client API, let's take a look at the sort of middle ground option. Instead of using a dedicated client, what we want to do is I want to quickly build an integration application. And we're going to use a separate project, a separate library called Spring Integration. Spring Integration lets you talk to you know, everything, basically. So Kafka, RevenQ, FTP servers, uh, you know, Amazon, Google, I mean, whatever. There's, there's integrations for all these different projects in Spring Integration. And we, are, uh, I, we like Spring Integration because it encourages people to think in a pipes and filters style architecture way. Uh, and this is better for decoupling systems. This is also a great, it's a great framework to use when you have non-reactive APIs and reactive APIs, and you want them to work together. So we can use Spring Integration to build an application that talks to a RSocket endpoint uh, and maybe talks to something that isn't reactive, right? So you can mix and match pretty easily here. So we're going to build an integration application, integration.zip. OK. There we go. So there's my application. And in order for this to work, first of all, I need to specify the SDK. There we go, Java 15. Uh, and then second of all, I need to go to my build and add another module to allow me to talk to file systems, right? So I can, the way that Spring Integration works is that you have this idea of a, an adapter. And the adapter takes messages or events in the real world and turns them into Spring Framework message objects and lets you respond 
to those message objects. So we can use Spring integration to create an integration flow that talks to a number of, uh, of different endpoints and then invokes an R socket endpoint. Okay, so we're going to call this uh, R socket flow, and to make it a, to give you kind of an example of what you might use for Spring integration for, uh, I'm going to use the file inbound adapter. This is going to let me uh, talk to uh, a directory. I'm going to monitor a directory. Uh, on my desktop, so home, desktop, in, right? And it'll be a file, so, and I'll say oh, file, file, okay? So there's the, the Java IO file. And I'll say that I want the files inbound adapter uh, to use that file when it starts pulling for new data. <clears throat> I'm gonna tell it to automatically create the directory. And then I'm going to, um, uh, I think that's it. I'm going to build it, right? So good. So I'm going to say return integration flow. Dot, okay, dot from, and we'll say from files. I'm going to provide a puller because the file doesn't, the file system does not tell us what's happening. So we need to pull it. We need to constantly ask it. Uh, at a fixed rate, and here it'll be one <coughs> once per second. Every second, I'm going to ask if there are new files in that directory, and if there are files, yeah. I'm going to quickly transform those files into strings. So I'll use a transformer, and once I have that, I can provide my own custom transformer uh, to trim it just in case, right? Uh, and then once I have this, I want to then uh, handle the. Uh, I want to turn the the um, the message into an object that I can send to our socket. So I need to transform the name, which is the string that we will get from this file, into a valid object of type greetings, request, and response. Right? So I'll use this as well. Paste all that here. Okay, so string new greetings request name. Uh, do we not have a We do? Good. Oh yeah, string dot class. Okay, this can be a method reference as well. And then finally, with this, I want to send the greetings request that we have out to my R socket gateway. So it's pre innovation. An inbound adapter takes data from the outside world and turns it into a message. And then it sends it into the message pipeline. In spring innovation, a gateway sends data out and gets a response, or maybe it, it accepts a request in and it produces a response, but it's bi directional message in and out. Okay, so we're going to create uh, R socket equals R sockets dot gateway. We need the spring integration support for R socket here, so that's what I'm going to bring in as well. Okay, Maven. So it's going to be an outbound gateway. And what I'm doing is I'm going to send a request to the greetings endpoint using R socket. And the gateway has an R socket, a client R socket connector that I need to configure. So let's do that up here. Client R socket connector. Okay, if we turn, uh, and then this client R socket connector, this client R socket connector is going to need something. Uh, R socket strategies, maybe? I hope. Let me see. So, R socket strategies. Strategies. And we will say R C R C new client uh, R socket connector connecting to local host. Going to 888. Okay. And the CRC is going to have to, it's going to need the strategies and it's going to need, uh, that's it. So, we say return CRC. Okay, so I want to inject this as a collaborating object here. Now we say, okay, ask this in there. So client R socket connector. Uh, and then finally, we're going to, we have to specify the interaction model. Remember I said there are four different types of interaction models? Well, you have to be very explicit about it, right? So the uh, parameter here is a um, uh, R socket interaction model, request stream. And then finally, the expected response type is Greetings response, of course. 
and there's my entire pipeline. That's the entire thing, right? So now I can take this and put it in the Spring integration flow. And when the data comes back, I need to know that I have a reactive stream of results. So what I want to do is I want to split the data into individual messages. Instead of having a stream of results, I want to have a single message. Each greeting response is a new message. So I'll call split. But then I have a lot of messages coming. And I need to be able to apply back pressure. So I can use a spring integration messaging channel. And this is a very it's a generic concept, but you can use channels to uh, separate reactive from non-reactive code, and you can still they can still talk to each other because they both understand message channels, but the type of message channel uh, can change based on whether you need back pressure or not. So I've got that. And then finally, I can handle the new results. I can say, okay, for each new response that comes in, it's a greetings response, uh, sorry, response. Uh, and then I can write out the results, like so. So, system out. New meeting, a message. Greetings response. Uh, to string, okay, and then finally dot get. Now all I'm doing is I'm taking the message and I'm not logging it out. So let's go ahead and run this and see what we get. And there we go. So now we need to go to our directory, C desktop. In echo, uh, hello. Oops, something's wrong here. Connection refused. Oh, did I forgot to run this? Got to restart it. And there we are. Every second, I'm getting a response using this integration code. This is a very natural way to write services because I may have some things that are not reactive and some things are. But Spring integration can make it easy for me to integrate reactive and non-reactive data sources into one API. Okay, so that's one kind of client. But really, I think most of us are probably going to write a, a, a regular, you know, service uh, as a client. So we're not going to use Spring integration, uh, but we will use our socket. We will use the Lumbox support, and we might use security. So let's go ahead and hit join. And I'm going to open this up in my IDE. Uh, you may know client does it. And here, our application will, as before, talk to Java 15. And here, we're going to act as an actual client. So we're going to create an app application listener. To listen for an event in the Spring application context, uh, our socket requester ready. And I need a client object. I need something I can use to talk or make our socket requests. And the way you do that is with something called an R socket requester. The R socket requester is a, um, a sort of a client, but remember, in, in R socket, there's no such thing as a client and service. Once you have uh, an R-Socket connection, either side can be a client or a service. Okay, so here's the R-Socket requester library. And we're, you're going to see what I mean by that in just a minute. We're going to do bi-directional communication. So here we go, return event. And this event, in this event, I'm going to use the R-Socket requester. I'll say R-Socket requester dot route greetings. And of course, I need some data, so I'll go back here to my service. Here, greetings request and response. Greetings request, greetings response. Paste. Okay. Uh, and given the request, I'll say, okay, I expect the uh, data will be a new greetings request. Okay. And the, the data that I expect back will be a great response. And then I'm just going to log out the results, right? And so, so system out and line. Okay? So each result that comes back, I'm going to print out the results just very simply. Now, of course, this is an asynchronous application. So I need to make sure that the thread doesn't die. So I'll say system.lead.lead um, and sneaky throws. OK, so there's my new 
our socket client. Let's go ahead and run this and see what we get. And there we are. Now I'm using a Java API directly to make low level calls to the R socket service. Very easy. Um, so far, we've been talking back and forth with no security. So, what I want to do is I want to go. Well, no, actually, before we do that, uh, so far we've been using this R socket requester. Um, and I like the R socket requester, it's very simple. Uh, it's very easy, but if you look at it, it's kind of like, in this case, it's kind of RPC, right? I send the parameters here, I get the response here. And so if you want an RPC kind of experience with RSocket, then you can use a project that I, I wrote um, uh, called Retrofit, or sorry, RetroSocket, right? It's based on Retrofits. It's inspired by and Fane as well, so RetroSocket. And RetroSocket here, uh, Spring RetroSocket, is an experimental, not GA project that, uh, that you can use if you want. Uh, and it's pretty easy to get started. So you install it in your build. Make sure you've got the repositories for Snapchat, because it's not yet GA. Uh, so we'll go back to our build here. We'll say dependencies. Oops. And then we have to add in the Spring Virtual Socket dependency itself. That's this thing right here. Okay, and we need the version, 001 snapshot, that's right here. Alrighty, so Maven, re-import, reload. And in order to use that, you can create a very simple you know, RetroSocket uh, client using just a declarative interface. So interface, uh, greeting client, publisher of Greetings response, greetings request. Okay, so there's this, and I'm just going to provide a message mapping. So here's a client definition on an interface, right? And I'm going to say R socket client. And with this, I can now rewrite this code. I can write this new version using an R socket, uh, sorry, using a greetings client, right? Good. Okay, so here I will say client dot greet and then just subscribe so in this case i will uh, comment out the other one so that we can see that the results are coming from retro socket and not from the r socket requester okay so here we go there you go so now we have this very simple rpc interaction now of course uh, one of the things that's most powerful about r socket is that it's actually bi-directional you can do communication on both sides. And so it, to demonstrate that, I need to use R socket requester again. RetroSocket is not great if you want true bi-directional communication. It's only good for request response RPC. Okay. So the R socket requester is a client to our service, but it, it can also be a service. And the client can ask it questions. And the way you make this happen is by creating a bean that gets exported, right? So let's suppose uh, you have some state some client side state, so client out state, or some telemetry. Maybe the user is not in the game anymore. Maybe the user has left the chat. Something like this, right? And so I'm going to uh, I'm going to have a boolean field here, private boolean healthy, and it's just going to be an object that I will send to the service as a client. I'll send it every second, right? And if I'm healthy. Then the client will continue to send me, sorry, the service will continue to send me the client data. But if I'm not healthy, then the service will disconnect. It'll know not to bother, right? It'll say, oh, the user has left the chat room, or maybe the user is no longer at the desk or whatever. So even though the application has not shut down, we should not send any more data, right? Uh, and so I'm going to create a little help endpoint that the that will be a controller, an R socket controller, that we're going to, you know, it's going to have some fake data, just, just to demonstrate the idea here. So I'm going to create a new supplier, and I'm going to create a math.random uh, percentage of being uh, healthy or not. So 50-50 chance that the service is healthy, that the client, rather, is healthy, and that the service should continue to send you data. Okay. So I'm going to uh, also you know, slow this down a little bit so we can kind of see what's happening. So there's my controller, and I want my client to tell the service about this controller. To make this possible, I must uh, configure the R socket requester here. Okay, <clears throat> so R socket requester, uh, and sorry, I need to configure the bean for the R socket requester here. Uh, in order to configure it, 
there's a callback, right? There's a callback here where you pass in an R socket connector, right? So the R socket connector, there you go. And in order to do that, I need to provide uh, bean object who is a R socket message handler dot responder R socket. And then what does this return? This returns a socket acceptor. Okay, so socket acceptor. And here I say C, C dot acceptor. Good. Okay. Socket acceptor. There's my socket acceptor. There's my res my result. And what we're doing is we're going to tell the endpoint, we're going to tell the client what strategies to advertise or to use for encoding and all that. And then we're going to also tell it what controller it should expose to the world, right? So strategies and client health controller. There you go. There's my socket acceptor. And now I've done everything I need to tell the, tell the client to provide this endpoint called health. So now we need to rework our service to be able to talk to this client. And we can do that very easily by uh, injecting the R socket requester here, right? Client R socket connection. And we can use that. We can say, okay, well, this is a stream of greetings, but I don't want to take I don't want to take any data from the stream if there is no health from the client. So I can say client R socket connection dot route health, and I expect the certain data will come back. I'm expecting a stream of client health uh, states, right? And we don't care. We don't care if this data is, if this class is, um, if the um, health is healthy, right? Obviously, uh, we expect that it's going to be healthy most of the time, right? But what we care about is when it's not healthy. So I'm going to take the data, but I'm going to filter. I'm going to say, okay, filter the data. If it's healthy, that's okay. Let's drop it. We don't care about that, right? Uh, and so what I have here now is a stream of client health state objects. Good, okay? There's that. So now I want to say send back the greetings, but only if the health is empty, if there's nothing in it. See how easy that is to write in a reactive APIs? So I'm going to go ahead and run this service. Thank you for the countdown. We'll run this here. Oops, uh, wrong port. Okay, there's my service. And now on the client, we're going to connect, but we're going to also send a, an ongoing heartbeat of how healthy we are. So we should give back one or two records, but not all of them, because eventually it's not going to be healthy. See, there you go. It stopped sending more data because we can do bi-directional communication. This is very easy in an off-socket application for one side to at any time send data to the other side or in response to something. So the service is producing a response but at the same time, it's asking questions of the client. Now, finally, as we wind down, the last thing I want to show you is how to communicate metadata, right? Uh, and in particular, how to communi communicate security information. There are two different ways to secure a service in our socket. One is to use uh, JWT, which is a little bit more complicated, but it's definitely doable with Spring Security, uh, or to use username and password, kind of like HTTP basic. And we're going to use that one. That's called simple authentication. And so with simple authentication, uh, you have to configure the usual things in Spring Security. So security configuration. And I'm going to create a configuration class. And I'm going to create a bean. Whoa. Uh, a bean that gives us a map reactive user details service. Uh, oops, let me go back to my build here. And we I'll reinstate these, these, these dependencies that I commented out that are for security. Reload. OK, good. And in here, map reactive user detail service, we're going to say that this is the authentication database. I'm just doing something terrible, something that you should never ever do ever. I'm going to create an in-memory username and password. Don't do that, right? Obviously, this is just a demo. Uh, GLong password. And password, user, password, OK? There you go. So there's my, my security, OK? And then the other thing I care about is 
authorization. Uh, who, you know, who can do what, right? So payload, socket, acceptor, interceptor. This is for authorization, and I can use our socket security, security, to build this. So I say return security dot build, and I want to enable simple authentication. So that's basically the entirety of my security application. Now, in the request that comes in from the client, I can take the existing credential, the authenticated user, and I can use that in my controller. So here, I'm going to rewrite this code. I'm going to rewrite it. I'll create a new endpoint here. Uh, and instead of taking a greetings request, this version will take an authenticated principle of model of user details. Okay, user. So I'm going to take this authenticated user. I'm going to say return user details model dot map ud ud dot get username. Uh, and let's flat map that ud uh, into a call to this dot. Okay, map many this dot greet. Passing in the client R socket connection and passing in UD. So I'm, I'm actually just well, I'm going to pass the um, uh, this map that name into a new greens request name like so, and then pass it into that and so on. So I'm just rewriting the code to now take advantage of the current authenticated user and use that to describe who gets greeted in the response. Okay, so very very simple change of the code. This is still there. I'm just, it's not an endpoint anymore. I'm just delegating to it, okay? The actual logic of the, the controller endpoint is here. I'm expecting an, an authenticated user to come in and make the request. And when that when that happens, I get the user details. Well, this arrangement here where I have a uh, annotation and user details, that does not work by default. You have to enable it with a little bit of configuration. Uh, and that lives here in the security configuration. So here I say bean uh, and in the service, uh, I want to configure an R socket message handler. So R socket message handler. Okay, and this R socket message handler var R M H equals new R socket message handler. Uh, R M H dot get argument resolver add. And what I'm doing is I'm I'm uh, providing a authenticated printable annotation. This is like a filter that's going to process the results. Okay. Uh, and then finally, I'm going to set the R-socket strategies just as before. You've seen me do this a couple of times now. Strategies are used everywhere, so it's good to know about that object. Okay, return rmh dot, uh, and that's it, I think. Yeah, return that. Okay, so there's my service. And now on the client side, I want to talk to this new secure endpoint. And I can do this by setting up username and password authentication. Uh, th this is exp this data is, being, is, is going to be sent. Oh, it's the same. This data will be sent over the network uh, with metadata. And that metadata is what we care about, right? That metadata is how our socket communicates information uh, over the wire. And it's like headers, except instead of using a key, it's a mime type and a value. So here, we'll configure our private final username metadata. Okay. New username, jlong pw. Okay. And private final mime type. My type utils dot parse well known dot authentication get string. Okay, so there's my mime type. I'm just creating a, my key is the mime type, which is authentication, and the value is this credential. You shouldn't encode it in, in your source code, of course, but for our demo, it'll be okay. So, what we're going to do is we're going to use that connection in one of two places either when we set up the R socket connection. So here, for example, uh, this dot mime type, or when we make the individual requests, because remember the R socket connection is shared, so you can you can set up the data, uh, you know, two different ways. You can set it up when the connection is first made, or you can set it up, um, uh, you know, each request, each transaction, which is what we're doing here. Uh, either one is fine. It depends on your use case. Are you doing multi-tenant use of the same socket? If so, then you prefer to send it like this. Otherwise, send it like that. So the only other thing that we need to configure here is the encoding itself. Remember, we talked about the R socket uh, strategies customizer. Well, we need one of those. So return new 
browser, okay? Strategies.encoder, new, simple. And that's telling our socket, it's telling Spring how to communicate the metadata for simple authentication over wire, how to encode that information. So now let's go ahead and create a client and let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. There we go, Nihao J Long. It's sending the data over the network. My friends, we've looked at our socket today. We looked at reactive programming. We looked at how to take advantage of reactive APIs. We looked at Reactor, and we looked at uh, the Spring ecosystem there. Then we looked at how to build a basic R socket service, how it's easy to build on, it, on the basic support in Spring Boot. Then we looked at the RSC command line tool. Then we looked at the R socket and reactive support in Spring integration. Then we looked at how to build an R socket client. Then we looked at how to build an R socket client using RetroSocket, an experimental project that I built. Then we looked at how to use bi-directional communication. Then we looked at how to do security. Uh, I hope that you got some appreciation for the opportunity here. There are a lot of organizations that are using RSocket and Reactive Spring at great scale. RSocket is the first project that the Spring team at VMware and uh, Alibaba and Facebook and all these other organizations got together and we donated to the Reactive Foundation. We just founded this. This is a new foundation that we created and the first project is our socket. I, uh, there's a lot of interesting work being done by all these different organizations on this technology, uh, and we're working together. And organizations like Facebook and like Alibaba are using our socket at scale, and they have been for a while. I helped get Alibaba using uh, our socket, and it's working great. Right? They've talked about their uses of it there. So I hope you'll consider it. I hope you'll give it a shot. You can see that the support in Spring is rich. It's everywhere. It's GA, it's generally available. Uh, thank you for your time, my friends. I wish I could be there with you, uh, hopefully next year, you know? And I'm happy to take questions now. Jashu, could, could you hear me? Could, uh, could you check the mm, web based message with the slider? There uh, are some questions. So you can bring the page to the screen so the audience can know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't understand. Oh, you don't understand? Okay. Can you? Just, just, just move. There you go. Yeah. Yes. Share. Share what? You want to? Sh you want to share my screen? What web page? Oh, is it in? Uh, do you send it to my Twitter? Webex chat. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, cool. <sighs> Let's see. Will we not suggest our software? There's an echo. Uh, what I would suggest not using our socket um, if you're not already a little comfortable with reactive APIs, of course. Um, but for service communication, for service to service, our socket is the best. I cannot imagine not using it. For the open web, that might be a little bit more difficult, right? You'll probably need to speak HTTP to the outside world. But for intra-service communication, RSocket is perfect. I, I love it. Uh, do you know the perform performance of RSocket compared to traditional HTTP requests? Uh, yeah. Uh, depends on what you do, of course. But in general, RSocket is much faster than HTTP and HTTP2. And it handles more scale, right? So uh, it's also much faster for you because there is the opportunity to do things that a service mesh would do 
with our socket as well. So in some in some scenarios, it's also a much faster alternative to something like Istio, right? It's very very powerful that way. Uh, is there a quick comparison with GraphQL or WebSockets? WebSockets are a binary protocol, uh, but they they're they're very basic. They don't give you even something as simple as headers, uh, and so it's very hard to do security if you have no standard for a header, right? To to propagate out of band uh, tokens and so on. Um, GraphQL is a way to read or to ask for data from an endpoint. Uh, it's HTTP based, so it'll be slower, but you know, it's nice. I like it. Um, you know, we actually have, we're working on Spring and GraphQL support. I think we're experimenting with some of that stuff. So uh, stay tuned. Um, I would use, if you want performance and you want the most flexibility, obviously our socket is going to win, right? But, uh, but if your client only understands WebSocket, then you can use that and you can use our reactive WebSocket support and have reactive data coming from our socket and send it to a reactive WebSocket client uh, very easily because it's just publishers. Reactive WebSocket publisher, reactive R socket publisher, reactive GraphQL publisher, etc. Uh, any other question? I guess that's it, huh? Uh, oh no, wait, is there a third one? Yes, is this is is R socket useful uh, for large data transfer? Yes, that's one of the big use cases, right? It's useful for any kind of stream of data. Imagine that you are because remember, like Facebook is using this, right? Imagine a large organization uh, where you have lots of users and they're on their Android client or their iPhone client and they're looking at their data, but then they go into a tunnel. They're driving in a car and they go into a tunnel and now they've lost their connection. With with our socket, uh, you can just resume the connection instead of having to query the whole thing. Um, what does Project Loom have to do with Spring Reactive? Uh, Project Loom gives you lightweight threads, and that will make it so that, remember when I talked about reactive programming, I talked about the three concerns, resource efficiency, consistent API, and more, more robust or, um, you know, tolerant APIs or services. The, the first thing Loom will help a lot with, right? Uh, and so that's, you know, that's, that's going to be very good. But even there, Loom does not solve all of our problems because it's still it's still much better to use asynchronous I.O. instead of synchronous Java I.O., even with Loom, because it takes a lot of RAM. So you, you're going to want to use asynchronous drivers like reactive drivers anyway. It's better in that case, too. So, um, But I can't wait for Loom. It solves part of one of the three things that reactive solves, right? So that's good. Uh, is there a quick, comp OK, can I use Apache Camel instead of Spring Integration? I, yeah, sure. I guess I, I don't use Spring, I don't use Apache Camel that much. It's very nice. I don't know if they have R socket support. Is what I'm trying to say. I don't. If they have an R socket adapter, then yes, please. I wasn't trying to. Um, I, I was trying to show that Spring Integration gives you a way to integrate R socket with other things. Uh, but if you have an Apache Camel plugin or extension for uh, R socket, then that would work as well. Yeah. Looks like I got all the questions. Great. Uh, someone said that the, the transfer speed of all socket is faster than HTTP, ten times faster. It it could be. Yes, that's the point. Right? They 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 created this. These are engineers, very smart people at Netflix and Facebook, and they created this after gRPC was already created, after HTTP2, right? They knew about all these things, and they still wanted to do better. So this was built after all those things were already out there. Um, I don't know what the particular example is. You know, maybe it is ten times faster. I don't know, but uh, but I would I would try it, and it, I, it wouldn't surprise me. Let's put it that way, uh, because it's just built. It's, it's built to be faster, but it's also built to be a lot more scalable, right? I can have, I can handle many, 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 many more transactions because it understands back pressure and it understands reactive APIs on the network protocol level, not just on the um, in the Java API level, right? Uh, remember, when you do reactive HTTP, there's no such thing as reactive HTTP, right? So in in the reactive web client, in in the sorry, the reactive web service in Spring. If you use Spring Web Flux, Spring Web Flux gives you a the ability to 
see a disconnect, a client disconnect. And when that client disconnects, the service cancels. It applies back pressure one time to everything that was involved in producing the response. But that's not the same as being able to say, okay, I don't want any more data right now, but in 10 minutes I will, or an hour, or whatever. So I can do session resumption with RSocket. You cannot do that with HTTP. So it's more efficient. Uh, you can use Java 8, of course, but uh, why? Don't, don't use Java 8. It's such a bad idea. Um, yeah, you, yeah, Spring supports Java 8. Uh, you know, obviously, it, it, you saw it on the website, right? So everything will work okay. Um, but oh, it's, just, it's, just, it's just so slow compared to the new stuff. You know, why would you do that? 那就让我们谢谢一下嘉许，给他一个热烈的掌声。